Amen. Thank you so much for being with us in service today. Today's scripture comes from Psalms 143, 10. It says, Teach me to do your will, for you are God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this scripture. Dear Lord, we ask it be fulfilled in every single life and every family. Dear Lord, we ask you to be with us in this service. In the name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
This morning? What was that? We're all in our places. What's that? No, just that's just my mom. Sharon knows mom. Anyway, okay. A few quick, quick, quick announcements. I want to reiterate bike night for our kiddos. They had the best time last year riding their bicycles and riding their scooters and whatever else, roller, anything they have to bring. Um, Madison got wise this year because that end of the building is sunny and that end is not. So this year there won't be quite so much sweat, I don't think. So um, she's doing it on that end this year. Um, 6.30 to 8 this Friday night, uh, kids 5th grade and below, kindergarten through 5th grade-ish. Yeah, I don't think any, I don't know if anyone under kindergarten can ride the bike. If they are, they're awesome and whatever. Last year... Our pastor rode the bike. Yeah. <laughs> it was something. It was Casey's bike, actually, so it was fun. Um, so bring your bicycle, scooters, ride at the church. They'll have pizza, crafts, all kinds of fun stuff, plenty of drinks, all the good times. I know all the former sixth graders that just graduated or are coming to be sixth graders are all sad. But you guys will have glow night. They're not having glow night. It's a thing. Okay. Um, so be sure to come to that, invite all the little babies in your neighborhood and bring them and drop them off and let them just ride bikes and have all the fun, right? Um, another thing, and I went totally, totally, oh, Wednesday nights. We just got finished doing a heaven and hell thing. Uh, we did a study on that. 
But we have started, last week we started on a uh, Gifts of the Spirit study, and I know we're going to get pretty in-depth in that for our adult Bible studies on Wednesday night. We'd love to see you uh, 7 o'clock Wednesday night for the adults, 6.30 for the youth, and everyone else 7 o'clock as well. we got something for everyone on Wednesdays. Okay, ushers, would you please come to receive our offering? Slip and slide coming soon. Our big outreach of the our biggest outreach of the year for now. Um, if you would like to bring clothes to donate, you may do that at any time. For please make sure they're clean and wearable and all that stuff. You know, you go through your kids' clothes in the summertime anyway. And if you'd like to donate any of those, please bring those and we will get those put away. All right, Greg, would you please pray and receive our offering this one? Oh 
that's empty will be filled. The heart that's broken will be healed. For I am the Lord your God. And I would say to you that I love you with an everlasting love. Just serve me. Fortune lies beyond the stars, those dazzling heights too fast to climb. I got so high to fall so far, but I found heaven as love swept blue.
to us this morning, that you chose this moment just for us, just for one person even in this room. And Father, I pray right now as we continue and worship you and power through the things that we're just looking at, I pray that you would continue to, to pull us and wrap your arms of love around each and every one of us. There's nothing too great or small for you. We we'll just surrender all we are to you right now. In Jesus' name. Jesus.
Father, we do not mimic you. Lord, we revere you. We know that you are answered. You deserve all the hallelujah. Lord, I know there's needs in this house. But Father, we put you ahead. You are first. We give you the hallelujahs. And Father, you bless our hearts. You give us the desires of our heart. You heal our wounds. You guide us. Lord, we love you. And we need you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence this morning. And thank you for blessing our pastor as he brings a message. Hallelujah, Jesus. We love you. In your glorious name we pray, and we all said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. I enjoyed the song service. How about you? Amen. 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 Give our praise. Yes. Amen. I want to say welcome to all of our visitors. Thank you for being here today. We pray uh, the service has been a blessing to you. Uh, while we're getting ready, turn to John 16:33. Well, I hope you're having a great summer. Amen. Summer showed up. You know, we've had summers around here where it didn't show up. I can't remember when that was. <laughs> I, I want to preach this morning on the subject subject on faith that overcomes the world. And I suppose that if there was ever a time that we needed to have faith to overcome the world that we're living in, we need faith right now. Because we are living in perilous times. Things are uh, not even close to what we would enjoy or like for them to be. But um, God's going to help us. Can I hear an amen? amen? Let me read this verse of Scripture. John 16, 33. I'm reading out of the Amplified Bible, so it might read just a little different. I have told you these things so that in me you might be made or have perfect peace. In the world you have tribulation and distress and suffering, but be courageous. I have overcome the world. Would you bow your head with me right now? Father in heaven, we thank you for your faithfulness unto us. And Lord, we don't take anything for granted. We appreciate everything you've ever done. And we worship you. We are followers. We want to be your servants. Help us this morning to share the message of hope and faith. Open our hearts to receive. Open up my heart to speak just those things that need to be said. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Well, in John's day, there was trouble and perplexing problems and situations that uh, seemingly could not rectify itself. And the early church found comfort 
in serving God, finding Christ as their Savior. And I don't know how it could be any worse then than it is now. But we're living in very perplexing times. Troublesome times. But God's still bigger than the problems we face, and we have to understand that. But when these scriptures are written, they were written to a group of people that was living in a world that was turned upside down. Rome made war, people dying, struggles, the economy was bad, nothing seemed to be working. And so when John penned these, these words, he, uh, he was speaking to them that if you have enough faith, God's going to see you through all of this. And that's going to be my message today is God's going to see you through it. It's going to get better because God said it would. You see, God gives us the power to overcome or go through any situation that you're in. God gives you that power. Amen. If you read 1 John 4, he re it reads like this. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Now, when you read that, I want you to understand what he's talking about that he overcome. Cults, wars, sin, drug abuse, alcoholism, hatred. The streets were filled with all of that in this day. And so when John wrote or when John spoke these words, he was speaking to a group of people that was looking for help, that needed something to point them in the right direction. And he said, then he goes on to say, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And I've quoted that a lot, and you've heard other preachers quote that also, that it's inside of you. God is greater in you than the enemy that's coming against you. And it doesn't matter to me, you know, really, I, uh, I've just learned whatever comes, God's going to fix it. Whatever happens, God's going to be uh, uh, in charge. He's going to take care of everything that I face and everything that I have to go through in life. And so I just keep believing that. And I, if you're around me very much, you'll hear me say, God's bigger than that problem. And you know, people come to me all the time. I've got an issue. I've got problems I need to deal with. And we'll talk about it for a moment or two or a minute or two. And my next words is always, God's bigger than that problem. You see, you have to come to an understanding that God's bigger than the issues that you're facing in your life. And it doesn't really matter what the problem is. God's bigger than that. I don't think we have anybody here that's on drugs, but there's no drug addict that's so hung up on drugs that God can't deliver them from that. Or alcohol, or you name the problem. God's bigger than the problem that you've got. Could even be a sickness in your life. And you that know me know that I've been through a few things. But I want to tell you, God has been with me every step of the way, and I'm still kicking, and I feel better today than I have felt in the last three or four years. Can I hear an amen out there? Amen. Glory to God. And that's because God is greater in us than any obstacle that would come against us. Thank God for that. God's power is found in his word. Now, I make it a point, I make it, it's part of my, and probably you, some of you are probably tired of hearing me say it, but I get up every morning, and you know I'm addicted to coffee. <laughs> Hello? Of course, none of you are. I, it's just me. I'm the only one here that's a coffee addict. I don't start anything else except the coffee pot. That's the first thing. But when that coffee gets run through that, that, that pot into that cup, I uh, turn on my phone and I'm in the book of Philippians and I sip that coffee and listen to this man read the Bible. 
And I, I've had people tell me, you know, kind of jokingly, but they'd say, well, how many times do you have to read the Bible through before you've read it enough? Well, let's just talk about your favorite song. How many times do you have to hear your favorite song before you say it's enough? A million times? Some of you are still singing those songs that were sung back in 1962. For the younger people, that was a time period that we grew up in. <laughs> and we're still not tired of that song. We're still not tired of it. Some of you right now wishes that we would sing Amazing Grace. And we will. We'll sing it. But you never get tired of that. And that's the way it is with the Word of God. You never get tired of reading the book. The book begins to produce inside of you power. It produces spiritual power. Let me, let me give you some thoughts on that. It says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, uh, when it uses the word quick, if you go home and look that up from the English to Greek or Greek to English uh, dictionary that you've got, the word quick always translates alive. So the Bible is alive or it makes alive everything that it touches, everything that it reads, everything that comes in contact with the word. The word makes you alive. It brings a sense of life. If you'll think about it, if you'll just think about this for just a moment, some of those days when you've been discouraged and you have you, the paycheck wasn't enough or the bills was greater or the kids are sick or you've got other issues that you're dealing with and you're just down and discouraged a little bit, have you ever noticed that when you pick that book up, you can just go right to that place that you need to go to and the words that jump off of the page of that Bible jumps into your heart and all of a sudden you begin to feel that overcoming spirit that comes through faith and through the power that the Word of God produces. Now, some of you are probably not as interested in this as I am, but uh, uh, on Facebook I plugged into uh, archaeological discoveries. Maybe some of you are into that. I can tell by the look on your face. I'm the only one here that gets that. But I like finding out where they're digging and what they're digging up. And it's probably, this is probably the boring part of the sermon for you. Just put up with me for a minute. I was very enthr enthralled with this, this thought that they came up with and that they'd found. But in Norway... Being the glaciers, we are in a state of global warming. The glaciers are going back, and when they got back so far, but by the way, there's been a lot of global warming down through the years before cars were going. They had some global warming. This is a cycle. We get cold, we get hot. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but we're in a global warming period right now. It was 104 degrees at my house yesterday. <laughs> and that was in the kitchen. <laughs> that wasn't quite true. <laughs> my air conditioning man came in and said, I know better than that. <laughs> but they found a skeleton of, and I don't know how they could come up with the age, but... They said he was about 15,000 years old. And as they got to digging this site out, they found his sword and some other paraphernalia that he had had with him. Uh, the handle had been eaten off by just life and being in there. And that wood don't, sometimes that wood don't last very long. But they showed a picture of the, the sword, his weapon. And it was about that long. And he said, it's got a little surface rust on it. But he said, when I put my hand to test the edge, he said, the edge was razor sharp. And I thought, man, I'd like to know what kind of steel he had in that knife. <laughs> you just sharpen it one time in the last 15,000 years. 
that's a pretty good that's a pretty good whetstone. But I, as I, I thought about that, and I thought, you know, that's really how the word of God is. The word of God can lay dormant, but when someone picks it up, it's still got an edge, and still cuts, and still works. And it, it, the scripture that that we read here, it said. Uh, it, <coughs> You have to excuse me. Uh, it says, um, And the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And I think it's important that we understand why, it has, why they brought out the fact that it has two edges. Now, we don't go to war with swords now. Uh, machine guns and pocket knives is about as close as we get to this. But if you stuck somebody or anything with a sword that doesn't have two edges on it, sometimes it gets stuck where it's at and you can't get it out. And on some of these swords, they'll have areas on it where they'll cut out so that it can bleed out and you can knife someone, get the sword back. Well, that's the way they fought. That's the way they, uh, wars is not a new thing. It's been going on since people's been on planet earth and it's going to continue to go on until Jesus comes and catches us away and that's just that's just the fact of the matter but I thought about that and I thought it cuts going in but it cuts coming out too so you can use the sword you'll not lose the sword when you put the sword into your enemy he loses his life but you don't lose your weapon. You can keep, keep fighting. You can keep going. The rest of that scripture says that that two-edged sword, it divides the soul and spirit, the joint and marrow, and it is a discerner of thoughts, and it knows the intents of the heart. So whenever you pick up this book and the Holy Spirit begins to work and deal in your life about issues and things that you're dealing with, all those problems that you think has no resolve, no answer, and you've done your dead level best to figure out how to solve the problem and you can't do it, the Holy Spirit through the Word of God can part the joint and the marrow and He can show you an answer. He can cut right down to the chase and He can open up and He can show you your heart. He can show you the intent of your heart. He can tell you why you're doing what you're doing. He knows exactly where you're at. The word is like a two-edged sword. And once you use it, you don't have to worry about it getting stuck in combat because it'll come back to you and you can use it again and again and again. And I'm going to tell you something right now. The world that we're living in, people are either going to commit their lives to Christ and come into the church or we're going to end up doing battle because they're going to try to steal your faith. They're going to try to steal your joy. Do you really need to be a Christian? Is there really a reason to go to church? Look at all the problems that, that's in the world. Look at all the problems you have even in the church. And where is God when you need him the most? Uh, see, if you've got your weapon, you can pull it out and you can begin to attack the problem. Every problem that comes, you've got a defense. You can use it. I'm telling you right now, don't let it, don't, uh, don't put it down. Use it. Continue to use it. It goes on, that scripture goes on to say, Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ. Now, I want to explain something that I feel in my heart needs to be said. You see, uh, uh, let me read John 3, 3 uh, first. And, uh, it says, Jesus said unto him, Truly I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, uh, here's, here's the thing. Sometimes our faith is misappropriated. You, you know what I mean when I say that. Um, we belong to an organization. It's a great organization. But my, my faith is not in the organization. 
Uh, they can help you in some ways, but they can't save your soul. And they can't help you when the fight is on, when you're battling the battle, when the issues of life seem overwhelming to you. The organization that you're in, all they can do is say, we're going to pray for you. And you're going to have to do the fight. That's why you have to have the sword. That's why you have to know the word. That's why you have to be on your feet. That's why you've got to pray. That's why you've got to get your life aligned up, going in the right direction. Because the battle is always one-on-one. -on -one. It's you against the devil and anything he throws at you. Thank God for the organization. Thank God for this church. Some of you have been here and we have worked and labored and we have built this church. And to me, it is a magnificent place to come and worship God. As a matter of fact, if I'm going to Choctaw to do something downtown, I live over here on Anderson Road. There's other ways it might be quicker to get there, but I always come down and go up 15th Street because I just want to look up and see what's going on at the church. Can I hear an amen? There's something about the mowed yard, that road that kind of bends. In the evening when the lights are all on, it is breathtaking to me. First time I saw it, it put a smile on my face. I drove by here yesterday after I'd done everything, all the things that I needed to do. I drove by the church and I said, it's still there. And isn't that something to look at? The only thing that I would do different on this building, I'd put a bigger cross and a bigger steeple. And if we hadn't run out of money, I'd have bought it. Amen. They can't upgrade that. You say, preacher, what are you trying to say? My faith is not in this building. It's not in this church. And as much as I love, and some of you are visitors, so you don't know me, but if you're part of this church, I'm telling you, you're part of the family. And we're all brothers and sisters, truly. And we help each other. And we befriend each other. We work for each other. We, we're, this is a great church. This is a, a place to raise your kids and to be a part of. So thankful for it. But my faith is not in the people of this church because people fail and preachers fail. And buildings get old and decay and fall down. Tornadoes hit them and things happen. And so my faith is in none of those things. None, none of those things. They, they help me recognize God. They help me in times when I need to see God but even this Bible, as powerful and wonderful as it is, it's only a book that points us towards God. It's not God. This is not a. This is not God. But it show it'll show you where God is at. So we have to put our faith in Christ. You see, the Scripture says, uh, the ones that I just read, he said, Jesus said unto him, except a man be born again. Now, this is old hat, what I'm going to say. If you've uh, been around the church any at all, we, you've heard someone talk about that born-again experience, and maybe you've heard me speak on it. And he was talking to Nicodemus. He was, Nicodemus was a wealthy man, educated. He, I believe he was part of the Sanhedrin court, uh, a Pharisee, uh, uh, he got to sit at the good seat downtown when they were having potluck dinners. I mean, that's the kind of a guy he was. He, he was uh, a man that was in the know. And he had tried some religion. You see, that's another thing that you've got to understand. Just having your name on some church roll is not enough. You see, you've got to have an experience with God. And you have to keep that experience up to date. Or it'll get a little old on you. And so you got to renew it. you got to go back. you got to get take another dip. Uh, sometimes, you know, when we baptize people in water, 
There's sometimes people have made new commitments, new dedication. They want to get baptized again. I, I told one person, I'll baptize you as many times as you want to get baptized. That is not a problem for me because I want you to make heaven. That's what this church is all about, getting people saved, getting them into heaven. And so uh, Nicodemus, he asked the question, he said, how can a man when he's old be born again? You know, if you stop and think about that, I, you just ponder that because... When I started out in the ministry, uh, probably everybody in, in a town knew something about being born again. And maybe even had some scripture because they'd went to a church or a vacation Bible school. But now, because of all the struggle that the churches went through, you see, they kicked Christ out of the schools. See, when I went to school, we did a thing called the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag. Mr. Bledsoe was our teacher. After we went through the pledge, she read some scripture, and then she would pray. And every kid in that class had an opportunity to be exposed to God. And they taught evolution, but in the same breath they taught creation. So kids grew up in a classroom that believed in the sanctity of life. Now, we didn't like each other. Listen. There was a lot of fights in the parking lot, but nobody got shot because we didn't want to kill anybody. We just wanted to give them a black eye. You understand what I'm saying? And that's, a, that's, the, that's, the, that's the world I grew up in. It's a different world today. I mean, you know, you tell a kid he evolved from a lower primate, and then when he acts like an animal out on the streets killing people, don't be surprised because he's doing what he's been taught and he's been taught that there is no God. You live your life for the pleasures you get now. When it's gone, it's gone and it's over and there is no judgment. There is no God. There's nothing greater than what you're doing right now. I've had more than one person tell me God is no bigger than that brain between your ears. That's where God lies. You want to make him God? Make it God, but you can make it something else. And I thought, my goodness, hell is going to be full of people that have been misled. And, and they're going to be very discouraged when they find out or hear the words, Depart from me, you, work, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Just go on. Go away. We're going to make it because of the blood of Jesus. How do you do that? Well, we got the natural birth. And we got a spiritual birth. Now when you pray through and ask God to come into your heart and in your life, I want to tell you, uh, sometimes it's a tremendous emotional experience, but sometimes it's just a commitment of faith. And you just pray the prayer. And I've had a lot of people I pray and said, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? That's the, that's the, 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 the important thing is, do you believe that Jesus died on that cross? Yes. Do you believe that he rose from the dead on the third day? Yes. Then you're a candidate to believe God to have a new experience happen in your life. While we're on this subject, let me tell you something right now. What we need in this church and other churches is we need a new experience. We need to go back. Paul, writing to the church, said, you need to do your first works over. And he's talking about recommitting your life to God in ways that sometimes can kind of slip. Sickness and kids and jobs and 
all the struggles, next door neighbors, you can just start naming all the things that, that go through that pull you from this away and that away. And sometimes, you know, you don't even realize it until you get just a little cold in your soul. Let me take, let me throw this out to you. And God really got on my case about music. Some of you have heard this before, but it had an effect on me and I feel like it deserves to be repeated. Man, I, I never wanted to hear any commercials. Ting, 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 ting. I don't like that song, ting, ting. Anybody, anybody? Man, I might be over here. I might be listening to something I shouldn't be listening to. God began to deal with me and he said, you need to worship me and you need to draw closer to me. And the reason why you feel like you do is you're not as close to me as you need to be close. And he said to me, God spoke to me. Now, down inside, I'm only 19 or 20. <laughs> I went to Air One radio station. Oh my, some of you, I can tell by the look on your face, you're saying, no, preacher, no. Tell me, no, you didn't do that. Yes, tune it in, turn it up, and pull the knob <laughs> off, and just leave it right there. And you know, I get in that car and I'm heading off wherever I need to go. And I have learned to love every song that's on that radio station. Roll back that stone. Yeah. Do you know that song? Yeah. You do. <laughs> then me and you can sail on the same ship. <laughs> Roll back that stone. Roll back that stone. Man, I wish I could sing. Go, I'd cut loose right now and give you three bars of cut, roll back that stone. Boy, about the time they hit it the third time, I'm driving down the road and I'm thinking, roll back that stone. <laughs> oh, glory to God, I felt that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Probably older people wouldn't be as in tune to Air One as maybe a 19-year-old. But I'm going to tell you something right now. It has a gospel message. It'll lift your spirits. You know, I'm not saying you can't watch something else on TV or what, listen to something else. It's just something God was dealing with me about. And it was being to revive my, because, you know, sometimes when you're suffering other things, it'll, you'll start drawing more to the problems that you've got than to the problem solver. And I've had a couple of surgeries and I begin, I'm thinking more about them than I'm thinking about the problem solver, the healer, the victory, the one that causes us to overcome. And all of a sudden, right, roll back that stone means something to me because it brought a sense of joy. I'm focusing on the things that I need for God to do when he did the greatest thing that he could do for any human being, he came out of that grave on the third day and he reached down out of heaven and I believe all of us are Christians and he plucked us up out of the muck and mire and he set our feet on the rock and he's established our goings. The God we serve is a merciful God. Roll back that stone. So... I begin to put this message together and I got to thinking about well what is the object of our faith? If it's not the building or an organization or the people or the preacher, we're all fallible and this will all blow up and go away and and where's our who who what what where is it? And the object of our faith is Jesus Christ. He never changes. He never falters. He never makes a mistake. He never does anything wrong. You've got to trust God with your life because a tor tornado might blow the church away, but it won't blow God away. And in your darkest hour, in that moment in time, when everything has went sour and up, your life is upside down and you're saying, what am I going to do? I'm going to tell you what. 
You can go to Christ. He's the answer to every problem you'll ever face in life. We might be having church under a bridge, but brother, you can have church anywhere. God, When God shows up, that's what church is all about. Can I hear an amen? Peter made a confession. Peter was outspoken, loud. Um, I would say uh, pretty much an extrovert who uh, wasn't afraid of anything. And in Matthew, the 16th chapter, he's, Jesus asked him the question. He said, who do people say that I am? And he was speaking just to Peter. Peter said, well, some people think you're John the Baptist. And there's other people, they, they think that you're Elijah or Jeremiah or some other prophet. They know you're a, a good man. They know you're a great man. And so probably a moment or two came through and times they all stopped and thought and did I give the good answer? Did I give the right answer? And then Jesus asked Peter another question. But who do you say that I am? It doesn't matter what the rest of the world believes. What matters is what do you believe? Where are you in your faith? Now, we're having battles across America and part of the battle is in the church because they want to take Christ and the blood of Jesus out of the, the question. I've had more than one person tell me all roads go to heaven. Oh, well, no, they don't. All roads don't go to heaven. The road that goes to heaven is stained with blood, has blood footprints going to the place that I want to go. It's where Jesus paid the price. And everybody that's going to go there is going to get their ticket punched by the, by, by the Savior. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. So I ask you the question, who is this man called Jesus to you? Who is he? Do you know him? What's, what, what does he mean in your life? Of course, Peter answered, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus' response to him was blessed. Blessed. That means in plain English, you are blessed because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my father, which is in heaven, if you're here today, and I believe everybody here today is Christian and saved, that wasn't something that you thought up yourself. It was something that God put in your heart. You begin to search. You begin to look. You found Christ. And the next thing you know, the power of the Word, the power of the Holy Spirit began to work on you. And He drew you into the place where you're now a Christian. You committed your life to Him, made that confession. But I want to show you the world's alternative the alternative to Christianity and it's very rampant in the world today 1 John 5 19 says we know that we are children of God and now he's talking to the church he said and that the world is under the control of the evil one so we got two entities going this morning in this church and every other church. You got people that are believers, and I believe you are believers. But we're living in a world of ungodly, unsaved, unrighteous people. They're not looking for God, they're looking for fun. They want to have a good time. Sometimes the mind is deranged. They're looking for trouble. They're looking for problems. When you walk outside the church, 
And sometimes it tries to come in the church. Many churches today have things going on in the church that they don't really believe, but they're trying to use that as a way to maybe get other people to come in and they can see that uh, maybe there is something that we need to get a hold of. I'm going to tell you something right now. You cannot, you cannot compromise your faith. You cannot compromise the book. This book is the guideline. It's the pattern leading us to Christ. We live by what this book says. If it says turn left, we're going to turn left. Get baptized in water. Take communion. Pray. Seek the face of God. But I'm going to tell you what every one of us needs to do. We need to take a look at the world right now and see what's going on in the world. We are having a lot of mass shootings. Now, we used to get mad and punch each other, but I've never felt like shooting anyone. But I grew up in one world, we're living in another. You see the violence that's on the streets of America today? Sometimes one party will try to blame the other party. Well, it's because of them. But it's not just that. Look across the, the, the pond. Look in the other countries. There was a mass shooting somewhere last night over in uh, one, of these, uh, one of these countries. About 18 people was killed in a bar. Boom, boom, boom. It's gone. Well, if you don't have God, how many sees what I'm trying to say? You see, we're going to have to start exercising faith. Let's stand to our feet, if you would, please. There's nothing good about Satan. He's a murderer, a liar, a deceiver, and he will transform himself into an angel of light. So you have to be careful. The devil is alive and well, and he wants you back. We gotta be, we gotta be, we gotta be on our toes. Let's bow our heads, we're gonna pray right now. Anybody here need a fresh touch from Jesus? I'm going to pray for you right there where you're at. Anyone here? Just preach. Yes. Anyone? Yes. 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 How many of you got some issues you're battling, facing? Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Father, we just thank you for your faithfulness unto us. Lord, we pray right now in Jesus' name that that same spirit that drew us to find you as our Lord and Savior would draw us right now closer to you. Let our faith rise to the top, strengthen us, because greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. Lord, when we walk outside this church, protect us, Lord. Protect us in this ungodly environment that we live in. Put your hand on us, Lord Jesus. I pray it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.